Hello and welcome back to another lecture. This one returns to experimental designs, but this time we're mixing back in with that summary of experimental designs, basic ones that we've seen before, the analyses of variance that correspond to those experimental designs. So just a reminder that an experimental design is not first figured out and then later an analysis of variance is derived independently of that job of figuring out the experimental design. They go together. Once you know the experimental design, you know what the analysis of variance should be. So in other words, when you propose to do a study, you should already know what the analyses look like. Okay. So the experimental designs that I'm going to run through here are the same ones we've mentioned briefly before in another lecture about experimental designs. The one-factor completely randomized design, which is pretty simple. Then we step up to a randomized block design, which includes some attempt to represent spatial variation, could also be temporal rep variation. Uh, among the different treatment sets. Then there's a, a I guess you'd say a multiplication of that where instead of one factor we'll talk about two. You can have three. You can get fancier than that but it's often hard to imagine and visualize something more than three factors simultaneously. So a factorial design which I think might already be familiar to you based on our work with our uh, lab. Then a Latin square design which is actually depicted in this image here. The idea is that you have variation both uh, across the top and down the sides, um, although I know that's tilted at an angle, um, the idea is that the variations uh, even both across and down in your grid. I'll show you an example of how a study was conducted using that basic plan for sampling. Uh, it's a little bit different, but I think it illustrates the point. Uh, split plot designs are a bit more tricky to get your head around at first, it seems to me, um, but once you've thought about them a bit and maybe see an example that'll help, um, there are fancy version of blocks essentially, or plots if you will. And then repeated measure design I'll mention again briefly simply because it helps us set up some more sophisticated analyses that we'll get around to later in the semester as well called mixed effect models. So and remember all this time I'm going to try to show you the ANOVA models whereas we just tried to get the idea of designs across before now we match them with their analyses. And of course as you might expect those same analyses have assumptions that we must try to satisfy as best we can. So each treatment set is normally distributed. Again, we have bell curves that we're going to try to compare uh, in each of our treatment sets. Uh, the variance is homogeneous among the treatment sets, so the bell curves have about the same wiggle left and right. We assume that the experimental units are independent and identical, which means simply that uh, you could replace uh, a unit in one treatment with a unit in another treatment, and it wouldn't have affected the design I mean before you actually apply the treatments. So beakers or plots, etc., are interchangeable. Another assumption is no pseudo-replication. It's an idea that uh, really emerged in the 80s when a man named Stuart Hur Hurlbert wrote a paper uh, pointing out that a lot of people were committing this problem in field experiments. So if you can imagine a pond and somebody's taking lots of point samples, for example, plankton net toes or something like that, um, in the lake or in a pond, and then you treat each of those separate nets uh, that, that you've swiped through the lake as its own separate sample, that is not really truly a replicate. A, a net that you drag through a lake is not necessarily a replicate if the lake is the experimental unit. Okay? So the idea is that if you take a bunch of subsamples and pretend in your analysis as though those are separate replicates, you're committing pseudo-replication. We've become pretty accustomed to guarding against pseudo-replication since Herbert's paper, but it's still something you need to be aware of, and um, we'll try to talk about it some more this semester. We're assuming that there's sufficient replication. Obviously, three is a, a minimum to be able to talk about at decent average. You could have two, but then your statistics would fail, and in some cases you need a lot more replication than that to represent the variation that might occur in your data, especially in, for example, field studies. And I should also mention that an error term is often implicit in models and may not be expressly stated, but uh, it's there, and so we should remember that. And hopefully you can figure out that the reason this is a failed experiment is simply because there's insufficient replication. Okay, so a one-factor completely randomized design is about the simplest model we can come up with. We have some factor, and we might have multiple levels of that factor. Or in this experiment, we just simply have three treatment levels, no, low, and high. Those are all the same treatment. It's just whether 
we have none of it, a little bit of it, or more of it. Okay? We randomly assign the experimental units to each treatment level, treat them, let things grow, do whatever is going to happen in the experiment, and record the responses at the end, and then we conduct our one-way analysis of variance. And that one-way analysis of variance might look something like this. You would say commands like this in R, where you say, I'm going to define model as the results of my AOV, and that is just simply my response, in the previous example it was plant heights, as a function of my treatment. Okay? And then I just ask for a summary of that thing called model. And you would get a result that might look something like this. In our plain R text output, you don't see the lines and the tables. Something like this might come out of uh, SPSS, another stats package. But regardless of the package, you get the same basic design of an ANOVA table, ANOVA table, where we have between groups that are um, being represented as the total variation, the sum of squared variation. Remember, that's the individual values um, minus the mean value squared. Okay, That's the sum of those squares. The number of degrees of freedom, and so that would represent four treatments here, right? And then the mean square, which is simply the sum of squares divided by that degrees of freedom. Okay, And then the within groups represents how much variation there is as variation within a treatment. And you can see that's a pretty large number, but also notice that we summed across many, many individual points and that's why the mean square error is usually useful because per unit we have actually our lower total variation within groups than we have in the between groups. So the mean square error ratio, the ratio of the between to the within, the signal compared to the noise, in other words, is this number, the F ratio. We get about a threefold signal to noise ratio, and that's enough to be declared significant according to our customary p value cut off of a 0 0.05. Okay? So a one factor completely randomized design is pretty straightforward. You've seen ANOVA tables like this already and in fact conducted analyses much like this. So what if you had more than two levels of the treatment? Um, control low, medium, high. What levels might be different from other levels? We don't know. If you have more than two levels of the treatment, you still get a general ANOVA like this, but you might like to know which of these treatments is different from the control. Which of these treatments might be different from low or from medium or high? So we can't tell that from an ANOVA. We can only get a table like this that says, in general, there is some sort of statistical effect. So this one factor completely randomized design is straightforward, but like any ANOVA table, all it tells us is that something was happening here. So there are other things we could do with that. A post hoc test after the fact test is something you can do. Now, I grabbed this image also from SPSS simply because it's a handy table that shows um, a pretty good sample of the list of post hoc comparison tests that you could choose from, also in R. Now, the ones that I've seen most often are the least um, significant difference, uh, least, least squared difference. Yeah, I think it's least significant, least significant difference. Um, Chaffees I've seen fairly often, but I think Tukey's is used far more often these days, and I'll talk about it in just a second. Um, the Dunnett's test is one that you use to always compare any of your treatments against a control. So that doesn't mean you allow, you're allowed to compare low to high or low to medium, etc. It's always going to be relative to control for a Dunnett's test. And notice that these would assume equal variance. These would not assume equal variance. Okay? So there's been kind of a uh, surge of these in the past, and I would say that now we've moved on to other sophisticated models. I don't see as many of these being conducted in the literature as there might have been just a, a decade or two ago. So I, as I mentioned, the Tukey's test seems to be one of the most widely adopted ones. And um, there was obviously a competition uh, debate in a, w in a way between the different people proposing the different methods. And uh, Tukey, who as you might guess had somewhat of a sense of humor, uh, named his uh, study, uh, his, his uh, test statistic, the honestly significant difference. So you can tell he's poking fun at others who would then by implication be less than honest. Tukey, by the way, was a really busy guy. He uh, implemented lots of different statistical tests and uh, was the one to first define what a bit is in information, computer data, etc. Uh, he uh, first made box plots, and he has a few pithy quotes that are worth listing here for you. I'll let you read them. Um, his Tukey's HSD test is a good test when all possible pairs of treatments are being compared. So if I can just refer backwards again, that means we want to compare the controls, 
to the lows and mediums to the lows and mediums to the highs and all possible combinations of these. We want to know which ones sorted out to be different from which other ones. So here's an example of a data set that's in R. If we can look and see um, how many times does uh, yarn uh, wool yarn break under different amounts of tension. It's a, something you might use in the uh, fabric industry, right? You want to know uh, how much tension can be applied before you get a critical too many number of breaks. So we compute the simple one-way analysis of variance and then we can evaluate the results with a two keys HSD. As simple as that, you simply type into our two key HSD model where you specified your one-way analysis of variance in the model statement. And just like we saw before, there is a significant effect of tension and the two keys HSD statement would produce these results right here. And so it tells you essentially what you've done. You get a 95% confidence interval. And here is a fit and, uh, to the model. It explains again what the model was just to make sure you understand what you did. And so now we have all possible combinations. We had low, medium, and high, right? So we get all three combinations here. And we can see how much the difference was between medium and high, low and high, low and medium. And that's analyzing the difference now between the means of medium and high, etc. Okay? And these are the confidence intervals. So you can tell that our mean of 4.7 has a confidence interval which overlaps 0. In other words, 4 isn't really clearly different from a no difference, a 0 difference. And that's what our p-value states here. There's not a significant difference from 0 in our medium to high comparison. Notice that the low to high and the low to medium, on the other hand, had significant differences. Those error bars for the difference between means do not overlap with zero. Tukey's HSD can also uh, produce this graph, which repeats what we just said, but you can see it visually. Here's that high to medium comparison, uh, which overlaps with zero, and so that would not be indicating any sort of significant difference between medium and high tensions for the amount of wool breakage, uh, yarn breakage you get. But the high to low and the medium to low uh, treatment comparisons we see are uh, significantly different from each other. So you can do a post hoc test on a one way uh, factor, uh, one, one way ANOVA pretty readily. Now, what if you had something more complicated, like a factorial design, two treatments? Well, you could look at one treatment and then you can look at the second treatment, but in a factorial design, you're examining an interaction. And so you can't really evaluate interaction effects in a two keys HSD. You only can evaluate one effect or the other effect. So these are most useful for simpler designs, one-way ANOVAs. You could do it for two-way ANOVAs, but recognizing that you cannot evaluate the interaction sufficiently with that. So maybe that's why I see less of these things. Maybe we've been able to move on to more sophisticated experimental designs these days as well. OK, let's go back to the next step up. We're going to talk about a randomized block design, where if I have these blocks, one, two, three, and four, they represent some sort of gradient. It might be sunshine. It might be on the sunny side of the greenhouse getting over towards the dark side of the greenhouse. And I have two different treatments of A, A1 and A2, and I have five different levels of B. So I randomize the A and B treatments in this block, and I also randomize them in the second block. So yes, there's an A1, B2 here, and up here, and randomly it happens to be right next to it over here, and then down here. So every treatment is repeated in every block. Okay, That's a randomized block design. They're very effective in representing a complicated experiment, in this, in this case it's a two-factor experiment, across some sort of gradient that you're trying to account for in your analysis, whether it's chambers uh, in your lab, uh, growth chambers, whether it's uh, space in the greenhouse, whether it's a hill slope, etc. that I've talked about before. So in a one-factor randomized block design, you might be evaluating just simply one treatment. It might have three different levels of it, four different levels like we did before, but what we're trying to do is think about how those treatments might be affected by the spatial position, for example, in different neighborhoods of New York. Because, you know, we might be trying to conduct an experiment where we're trying to disprove Einstein's hypothesis that you cannot find a good sandwich in a city. So you would conduct that, that test in different neighborhoods where each neighborhood, you know, the West Village, the East Village, etc., might be different randomized blocks. Okay, kind of a joke, but you get the idea. You're accounting for spatial variation with blocks. That's an easy way to think about them, I, I guess. So a block effect is uh, something that you randomly assign treatments to, and then those are tested uh, in as part of the analysis, uh, and then you can actually uh, evaluate how much of the variation in your results is due to which block uh, 
your treatments were assigned to. So we add this line into our model, just like this. Model is a, the response as a function of treatment plus blocks. We've done this with our lab uh, for the paper helicopters, for example, where each of you group folks were a block because each group might handle things a little bit differently. In this cheesy example, you might see something like this, where you have three different kinds of treatments, two degrees of freedom, a decent sum of squares, and the mean square of error there, and the high F value. And the blocks, notice here, comes out as it representing a certain amount of the variation itself, and a substantial amount of the variation, and uh, but it has um, uh, a, a fairly uh, substantial number of units too, for example, six groups of people. So then the mean square value is a little bit less. The ratio of those two is, um, I'm sorry, the ratio of these two, the mean square here, is not what we compute. The mean square is relative to the residuals. So if we didn't have blocks in here, these were not in the treatment. If we didn't design the experiment to account for them properly, and we didn't uh, evaluate them in our analyses, all of that variation that's in blocks would be just lumped in with the residuals. And so then we compute mean square of error, 269. This amount of variation here, this sums of squares, would be substantially higher and would have a lot more residuals in here too. And so you might have a harder time detecting a significant effect. Okay, So the block essentially assigns a certain amount of this residual variation into the differences between groups of people or places or wherever you happen to be working. So here's an example. Let's take this blocks and let's just assume that I had done the exact same in results, the exact same analysis without accounting for blocks. The same row for treatments up here, right? I get the same sort of 2 and 539 and 269. But notice what happens with the mean square of error here. Now I'm going to compare these two to get the F ratio, whereas before I had 269 relative to 54 which yielded me an F ratio of about 5, a significant result. Now I get a 269 compared to a 73. That was still pretty good, but it's a marginal effect by our p-value cutoff. We would say it's not as obviously a, re a result uh, that we would call significant. It's marginal because a bunch of the variation that had been picked up and partitioned into blocks is now ir irretrievably lumped into residuals with um, a relatively high amount of unexplained variance, in other words. Okay, So you can see, I hope, how blocks can be really useful. And, uh, and if you design an experiment, recognize that they're there, and then account for that in the study, when you finally get around to analyzing it, it can really help you uh, break down the amount of residual unexplained variation into a smaller volume because you're accounting for some of that variation better. So let's go back to um, our organizational list here. The multi-factor or factorial designs are something that we've also played with in the lab. I think you'll maybe think this looks familiar. These are um, pretty effective at evaluating interactions between treatments. Where we have two treatments that you can go fancier, like I said, we'll stick to two here. And you might have multiple levels of each one. So for example, I have treatment A, and there's two levels, one and two, and I have treatment B with five levels and have all possible combinations of A and B levels, right? So I have two treatments with multiple levels in each. The experimental units are randomly assigned into each one of these boxes. I might have three replicates here, three replicates there, etc. I notice I'm not worrying about a block right now. We could also add a block to this if we wish to, depending on the experimental design. And so our model statement would simply be the response as a function of treatment A times treatment B, because we're looking at the multiplicative effect of these. So we're essentially asking, does treatment B change the effect of treatment A? Or vice versa, does treatment A change the effect of treatment B? How you say that really depends on, I think, what makes most sense to you. And so you would have this kind of ANOVA uh, statement, and the summary might be broken down like this. I'm not going to sweat the numbers. I'll just leave those as Xs. But you can say we have the rows and we have the columns, and that uh, treatment A times treatment B um, row of degrees of freedom is calculated as just simply the number of degrees of freedom for one times the number of degrees of freedom for the other. The residuals are calculated with a straightforward formula and you get a total like this. Okay, So now we have a pretty advanced uh, ANOVA table where we can evaluate the treatments A, B, the effect of A on B, and then any over leftover variation. And so we're really starting to um, be able to partition some variation pretty sophisticatedly and be able to evaluate some strong
kinds of uh, experimental designs. And so now you could also add blocks. So this is more representative of that table I was showing you before. I have treatment A, treatment B, and I had blocks, which I was just omitting a moment ago. But if I return to that basic design, this is how it looks. And we've gotten pretty good at breaking down lots of elements of that variation. So the, the factorial designs, I think, are a fairly effective way to uh, unravel some complicated and um, uh, interactive kinds of uh, processes that might be going on to cause patterns. But there is a cost to those in that you have to have lots of replication. Now, um, and it, it's, it's a fairly large experimental design. An efficient way to go about two different gradients would be a Latin square, where there's a gradient across and there's a gradient down. So obviously the gradient down, as you can see right here, but there's also an A, B, C, D, E, F randomization that goes on across here. And so the idea with the Latin square model is that every treatment appears in every row and every column. So A up here, yeah, and A, and A, and A, et cetera, right? And they're in a different row in every different column. So they're really randomized completely across that 2D space, okay? So the Latin square model is simply designed to randomize in these two different directions, and those are essentially being handled as if they were two blocks simultaneously. Now, like I said, I don't see a lot of these kinds of designs out there in nature, partly because we can't find these really simple orthogonal grids uh, very simply. There's usually a more complicated texture to nature. This comes really from agriculture. But on the other hand, one of our grad students, Mary Jones, did a really nice uh, use of a Latin square design when she sampled the uh, allergens on cats. So she designed these quilts, if you will, of different fabrics in a Latin square design, rubbed them all over cats, and then extracted out the allergen that makes people allergic to cats on the different fabrics, where just rubbing it around on the cat meant that a fully randomized in rows and columns design was really clever. And so yeah, I'm just going to show you the results of what she did, the two key subsets here. A, this is the nanograms per mil of extract um, that she was able to find. A was significantly less of this allergen than was true for B, which is cottons and wools. And then the polyesters had significantly more, again, in a Tukey's test of that allergen. So if you have a cat, and if you know somebody who's allergic to it, if you are, I think you want to avoid polyesters. Natural uh, fabrics are a little bit better for you. And if you could afford to live in silk all your life, you'd be well set. So the idea is that uh, the Latin square wasn't really the way she did the analysis so much as the way she used it for sampling. And so it was sort of, you, if you're going to analyze it, it would be treating these two different things as if they were blocks, just like we add blocks before. This is the way you would analyze a Latin square design. Notice that she just simply used the fabric in Latin square. I'm not talking about that for her analysis. But this is the same idea as a block. You just have two different blocks. So it's sort of like that idea of blocks that we saw before, horizontal and vertical blocks. So it represents those two gradients. Okay, I think one that's more complicated, and but is still pretty widely used because it helps to represent complicated uh, systems pretty well is something called a split plot design. So let me just go back to this basic kind of idea that we had A and B treatments, okay? Notice that I've got A2 and A1, and I've got B123, B123. Now what we're talking about is all of the ones in the top space here might be subjected to another set of conditions in addition to the A's and B's that might differ. The yellow condition is different from the blue condition. So the split plot design is just simply saying that there is not a homogeneous field in which these plots are set up. We have to split it in half and recognize that in the analysis. So imagine our con uh, experiment where we're uh, doing everything identically in both regions. We have all these combinations, A2, B3 is up here, A2, B3 is up here. It, everything's mixed up randomized in each one of these gray and white grids, but we have to recognize that there's maybe two different kinds of soils, two different sets of conditions, um, two different sets of climate conditions, etc., in these two different, quote, regions. So it's a main plot right here. Each region is a main plot, but we're splitting those two things into two different subplots, okay? So we have the two factors, A and B. We have two, two different levels of A, three levels of B, a bunch of different replication. And so the split plot ANOVA 
um, is going to be something that you could use to analyze a fairly complicated design because of course you could have more than yellow and blue colors here you could actually have a fairly complicated set of plots so the idea is that this whole main plot thing is nested inside the irrigation treatments if you will the yellow and blues here um, I'm sorry the the main plot effect um, plot one plot two etc is nested inside the irrigation levels I should say an example is grabbing from an agricultural data set okay and then we have to account for these split plots along the side so the ANOVA might look something like this again ignoring the the uh, example uh, sums of squares mean squares etc we have degrees of freedom for the treatment and for the whole plot error and then we have um, the treatments and then we have a second treatment so we have treatment I and treatment V and treatment I times V interactions just like we would in a regular uh, factorial design but we have the whole plot error and we have the subplot error at terms as well the residuals okay so notice what we're doing is we're representing um, the regular factorial designs but we're also representing errors due to the whole plots and errors due to the subplots or split plots okay so the way you might calculate these things would be um, fairly straightforward if you just simply set up the statement correctly in an uh, ANOVA but the, where, the way that we have to calculate the mean square error ratios is actually a bit more advanced R will know how to do that if you state this correctly here so you would say model is AOV of your response to treatment one, I, uh, treatment I, sorry, and treatment V, and that will automatically give you each of those treatment I and treatment V rows, right? If you say factorial, you get each of those. But now what we're also saying is error per plot, and that error per plot statement is going to be essential for the uh, R uh, AOV command to recognize this as a split plot command and uh, uh, split plot design. And when it does so, it will calculate things according to the correct mean square error. So notice that up here we compare, we can treat, we evaluate, sorry, treatment I relative to the whole plot error, but we evaluate treatment V relative to the uh, interaction treatment, and um, actually I should say the interaction treatment um, or treatment V are relative to the subplot error, as I'm trying to represent here. So MSV or MSIV are relative to the split plot residuals is what I'm going to get to. I hope that makes sense. I kind of fumbled around with that one. But the whole point is that we have a more advanced, sophisticated way of calculating the mean square error and therefore the F ratios because we've said specifically that there is this extra error in there to represent the differences between plots, our split plots. Okay? All right. One last one. Repeated measures. Repeated measures is a nice experimental design because you don't have to go out and get lots of new individuals every single time and especially if you have destructive sampling it's something that you, you see a lot in the medical literature because they want to test you know for example the effects of a drug on people so they want the people to be evaluated before and then after and they want to keep doing it repeatedly and see if there's a trend so they keep coming back to the same individuals so the idea is that an experimental unit is sampled again and again and again and so you see these kinds of trajectories through time in this case, this is mycorrhizae that depend on um, uh, plant uh, uh, growth uh, and, and the soil conditions, and um, it's related to the concentration of CO2 that was being injected into the soil. So they're evaluating CO2 effects on soil um, biogeochemistry, and that has a lot to do with mycorrhizae. So we're getting these trajectories through time here, right? And you might look at that pl plot and say, well, it looks like these are higher and they're going up but these are also going up and so how do you evaluate that well each of these things is sampling the same plot over and over and over again by in collecting some soil cores out and getting mycorrhizae same idea if you collected blood samples from people etc etc okay so the advantages and disadvantages of a repeated measures design are that it's like I said pretty efficient you just stick to a fewer in number of individuals you don't have to generate so many of them to conduct lots of replicates and lots of treatment combinations You're using the same units so you get lower variation for treatment effects because you keep coming back to the same experimental units over and over again. There's a lot less variation as there might be between completely independent units. Okay? Imagine, for example, the different paper helicopters we dropped. Some of them were really different from each other, but if we kept dropping the same one, they might be more consistent. Assuming, of course, we didn't crumple them and mess them up. Okay. Well, time is then a factor in these repeated measure analyses, and that can be really important 
because especially if you're looking at the dynamic system, you want to count for the effect of time. On the other hand, there are some disadvantages. We have to make some assumptions. We have to assume that everything you measure every time is normal, and that can be a real big problem. Um, it's, it's hard to obtain that in a standard analysis of variance uh, for repeated measures. We can get around that with some other more advanced methods, like I keep saying, but this is for a standard ANOVA, you have to assume that, which is uh, kind of related to sphericity, where multivariate normality is assuming in every direction they're normal. Sphericity is assuming that the variances are essentially spherical, that they're of equal levels in every possible direction. So um, those two assumptions are pretty restrictive. Uh, it, it's heaping on the same assumptions we've had for analysis of variance before. So with the standard AOV style commands, um, it's tricky to get these assumptions tested and get them to work. And there's always this risk of some inflated type 1 error. Um, that means you're rejecting the null hypothesis when it was actually true. An easy way to think about type 1 error is that you have a false positive result, a false positive. So there's this risk of more false positives than you would like repeated measures of ANOVAs. Okay? But we can, like I said, use some mixed effect models later. So it's also, depending on the software you're using, clumsy to get the data rearranged to make it work well for repeated measures. Um, the alternative, like I keep mentioning, is a linear mixed effect model, which means that we're taking into account just the fixed effects, like we would talk about normally, but also random effects. And so we can assign time, for example, as a random effect. You don't control time. It's not something you made happen, like a fixed effect. And so it's, a, it's an effective way to get after a repeated measures ANOVA. In fact, I think this is the way most people would do it these days. But let me show you another way it could have been done, may, maybe more so in the past. Um, let's say we have this mycorrhizal dependency, MD. I'm saying that's a function of treatment, the CO2 plus an error term in the unit. And that would be OK to work with that if all the assumptions were met. And like I said, that's kind of tricky. Uh, it might be uh, easier to go about it with this LME package in R, where we're using a linear mixed effect model, LME. And so this is an LME regression, essentially, where we say, again, mycorrhizal dependency is a function of treatment. Plus we say 1 is uh, split by this bar and the unit. So each unit, then, is the random effect it's through time time changes th for each unit in a random way we can kind of account for that so this just simply says there's this error term here that is being represented as a random effect and handles our temporal effects it's kind of like the one we had here except it's doing it much more efficiently because we're combining fixed and mi and random effects in these mixed effect models so trust me we're going to play around this a little bit easier the other nice advantage is that it lets you get around the problems of non-normal error and non-constant variance or sphericity. So there's more effective ways to get there than the old AOVs. OK, so let's see. We have these different fundamentally basic main kinds of experimental designs. There are prescribed analyses of variance that go with each one. And uh, they're usually to be expected uh, that you're going to see these same kinds of uh, model statements. If you say, I just split plot. Somebody who's doing uh, statistics should be able to reconstruct that ANOVA statement for you uh, and match what uh, you did. And same for the other ones. They're fairly predicted, in other words. Okay. All right. So one last thought about ANOVAs. Um, they're something that have been debated for a long time. Um, obviously, you might tell that Pedro and I um, have different opinions of them. I don't think they're necessarily completely out of date, but they have been around a long time, and we have more sophisticated analyses that we should prefer to do, especially if we're doing more sophisticated analyses. So some people would say they don't have a whole lot of value, and therefore, is your research worth anything? And some people might talk about what the ERP ratio is trying to actually tell you. And I'll leave that up for you to decide. Just know that there's um, other methods to go about this, and we're sort of recapitulating history here. And if you don't know about PhD Comics, uh, I really recommend you check it out, because it's pretty fun. There's a lot of good jokes in there. Sometimes inside, joke, inside jokes for scientists. All right. I hope that does it for you. And uh, we'll see you in the lab. Bye.